and uh, Resurrection Day. Uh, today is a special day for me and my wife because we're going to do the sermon together today. And we're going to be able to make a few points together and uh, turn to God's word and uh, be an encouraging time for uh, Kelly and Cheryl to get up here and be able to uh, deliver the, uh, the Easter service today. So she's going to jump back up here in a few minutes and uh, add a point and uh, I'm going to kick us off here in just a moment. So. I was downstairs uh, right as the first song was being sung. And I noticed the eggs were already being put out for the, the kids for the, the hunt. And I gotta tell you, I was tempted to grab a couple. I figured, what's, what's in these? Maybe there's a little bit three musketeer chocolate things or something in there. But I didn't. I, I resisted that temptation, although it was there. Um, Easter, for me, meant this first slide I've got to show you. Now, it's, actually, it's actually the other one. Uh, the other one. That's, uh, that's typical of what uh, me, my brother, my sister received on Easter from, from mom and, and dad, you know, the Easter money, if you will. And uh, that went on for years and years. So for me, Easter was one of the big three of the year. Christmas, your birthday, and Easter. For a kid. And so I got this uh, Easter basket type for many, many years, even when I went away to college. I'd receive the mail, a box right before Easter from my mom. She was very devoted to this. And she'd send me an Easter basket in my dorm in college. At first, I thought, oh, yeah. Okay. And then I, I took it to my room and put it there. And my roommates and the rest of the floor devoured it. They loved it. Okay. This is cool. Good, good. I was worried about that. But my mom was very devoted in that. It was very giving and loving about sending things uh, on, and Christmas and, and Easter. And so that was uh, nice to have that each year. There's a, a TV commercial out. Uh, I think it's by the, the Chocolatiers or the candy place, Cadbury. Uh, yeah. They have a TV commercial about uh, uh, Easter is, this is the title of it. They evidently make a, 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 gold, a chocolate bunny. They put a gold foil over it. It's called the gold bunny. I, I hadn't had one, but I, I can remember. But, but they're saying in the TV commercials, Easter is about the gold bunny. Easter's about the gold bunny. I, I, I missed it. I like chocolate. I do. As I've gotten older, I, I like a little more bitter taste. I even drink my coffee black, but I like dark chocolate now. A lot. So I like chocolate, but Easter's, Easter's not about the gold yeah. bunny. <laughs> Bunnies don't lay eggs. Bunnies don't lay eggs? I tell you, we're figuring this out here right as we go. <laughs> You know, Easter sermons have been going on the last 2,000 years. Right. And resurrection messages, uh, resurrection life have been preached and taught and for many years. So the concept today is not new, but I hope you'll be in a place to make some new decisions. You know, I got married, I was 28. The concept of marriage wasn't new to me. I was finally ready to make the decision and the commitment. For a lot of us, the idea of living a different life for God, a resurrected life, if you will, may not be a new concept. But I hope today we'll take some steps closer to making that decision to live that life every day. Because see, for the Christian, for the disciple of Jesus, the follower of Jesus, Easter, Resurrection Day, is every day. Right, we celebrate it every day because we're living a different life than we used to live every day. Yeah. That's right. that, was, that was a new concept to me. Going away to college and going to church on Easter, they told that, hey, today's not a special day. We're not putting up banners and streamers and doing this whole different stuff because every day of our lives is a resurrection day. Right. We live this way every day. Mm -hmm. You and I get to live this life every day. As I dive into this, I want to say quickly, uh, uh, Jackson has his family here. I think from P Pennsylvania, is that right? Yeah. 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 Jackson's a member of the uh, U of O uh, track and field team. I, I think your brother's coming here next year to be the same, right? The same thing. You're going to be here next year running yeah. as well? Aww. Nice. Yeah. Congratulations. That's awesome. All right, so we celebrate Easter every day, the resurrection every day. So this first point is simply called... Resurrection. We'll go to this uh, first scripture here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says, uh, verse 14, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus sleep in him. 
Wow. As a Christian, I believe this. I believe he was crucified on the cross, died, was buried, and raised to a new life. I mean, th this gets a little crazy. I, I am an organic chemist by trade, by training, by education, by my academia experience. Now, to think about the second stage of body, human body decomposition, you know, the 72 hour mark or so, and, and cell walls being burst, and after he's died, been buried, and, and all the ooze and the, 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 the parts of the body mixing and forming this organic soup, and that coming back to life in a human form again, freaks my brain out just a little bit. <laughs> and here, here's, here's some of the reasons why. I think about this one. Really, this is a divine experience here. Um, a number of years ago, down in San Diego, I got to work San Diego State in a peptide bonding. Peptides are maybe two or three long amino acid chains, very small protein chains, they're called peptides. And I was involved with peptide bonding to make larger protein chains. You get them to fold around themselves and create different shapes and to do different things. Uh, medically was what the idea was. I know some of you in the medical field go, oh, proteins, that's like shock. You know, that was an issue, but anyway. Um, so we were trying to do this, I think, to get two little peptides to join. And that's why I was working on those projects. You, you, had, you had expensive glassware. You had these incredibly purified uh, organic solvents in an organ atmosphere, argon atmosphere. And then you would put the, the, the two peptides and a bonding agent, and you try to get these to, to bond. And the one I was working on had this ester bond right next to the bonding site. And so it was very delicate. It wouldn't bond. And a lot of people, before I'd ever gotten there, tried this and weren't getting the bond. And then we did some other things, and I did it, and it bonded. Like, yes! But all that for a little, bitty, teeny, tiny, four-segment amino acid protein bond now, peptide bond. And I thought, that's unbelievable. One little cell of the human body, the, the mitochondria and the other organelles, you know, put these little chemical factors going on to make, you know, all these, uh, to make simply hemoglobin which is a vast chain of proteins fold around each other with an iron molecule in the middle to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide from, from the lungs. One little microscopic cell you cannot even see can make that. And I spent all this time and energy and money and others have to get this one little bond between two peptides. And we're like, yeah, it worked. And, look, and you pull out the MNR, MNR screen, you know, the peak sign, and go, well, here it is, the peak. And then, that, that, that's it. And, one, and, and why we're saying, that's it! Our cells and our body making these vast, incredible protein chains with, with iron in them. That's just hemoglobin. Wow. <laughs> and, and now there's all those cell walls of protein, lipid proteins have, have broken down and all, all those things have just oozed together and mixed and, and now you got this. And God says, arise. And it all comes back to the way it was. Just from a chemistry point of view, like, God is God. We can't even think about something like that. Let's just make it a, a, a hemoglobin molecule. And so God raises Jesus from the dead. I believe it. And the reason I can believe it is because I believe God created the universe. And when any one of our three children came into this world in the miracle of life, if God can do those things, he can tell a decaying body to arise and be a person again. I believe that. People tell me, how could you believe the Bible's from God? And it's just... Well, because I believe the one who wrote it is the one who made the universe. And if he can make this universe and create life, I think he can write something and keep it the way he wants it for a couple thousand years so I can read it and understand how to follow God. Yeah, sure. See, to me, it's not issues issue of the Bible from God. is do I really believe God is God? Because yeah. if I believe that, the rest is pretty easy. God is God. Um, with a resurrection is required a death first and that's what you and I decide to do when we become a disciple of Jesus Christ we die to one life to be raised to a new life 
And that's what we're supposed to be celebrating on Easter, that Jesus was the first to do that, and now we're called to do the same. To live this new resurrected life each day of life. If you would turn me over to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. I really did resist that organic chemistry thing. I wanted to go on even further, but I just knew I was going to, you know, I'd probably bore you, and I apologize if I did go a little too far, but I, it, it's one of those things that just kind of freaks my mind out. It just, it's hard to get around to what happened there. Chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the king of the air and the spirit who is now working those who are disobedient. For all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we are by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, that's God's motive, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we're dead in transgressions. The motive of God is simply love. We were separated and distant from God. We could do nothing for him, yet because of his love, he gave us a way back to him to live a new life. I've got to show you one picture. If we could scroll down to the, the, to the picture of the lights outside in our backyard. There we go. Thank you. Yesterday, some, uh, some came over to help decorate our backyard. That's over on Emerald and 23rd behind, uh, uh, right, uh, a few blocks from U of O and uh, by the um, Edison School. And today, later on today, uh, Dave and Melissa are getting married here. <laughs> and they have, I'll, I'll give you the story to, and, and then let that segue into some other stories. But uh, they have started coming to church and studying the Bible and want to get their life right with God and be, they live the resurrected life. And... One of the things to get life right is to get married. Amen. Amen. And to do this God's way. Amen. Well, I have been around town this week, and I love when folks ask me, oh, so what are your plans this weekend? Like the bank teller or the Safeway cashier or whoever. And they say, what are you, what's your plans this weekend? I say, oh, thanks for asking. Hey, I'm going over to help out with my, with my wife with the, the women's night, uh, it's a Friday night. And then uh, Saturday, we're decorating our backyard for a wedding we're going to have on Sunday. Then we have Easter service. I'm preaching on the resurrected life. And then a couple is getting married in our backyard after church. And they've been studying the Bible, wanting to change their life and do it God's way. And I've said that to so many people. Everybody I've said to says, that is great. They're going to smile at this. That's the way it ought to be done. That's been everybody's response. That sounds great. And I mean, the women I've talked to about it said, oh, that's so nice. That's so, oh. <laughs> and nobody's disagreed. Nobody's had a foul response to it. Everybody's like, yes, that's good. <clears throat> and Simon thinking, yeah, it's God's way. And it's good, and we know it's good. Now let's live it. Let's live his way and not our way. Let's live his resurrected life and not just what we want to do. So today, when I'm standing back there, and Dave and Melissa and some others that are becoming, and we talk about God and His Word, and they make a commitment before to each other before God and those Aww. witnesses, that for a lifetime now, they're devoted to, to God, but also to each other, yes. to becoming one flesh. Mm -hmm. And now the kids get to be raised in that atmosphere. Mm -hmm. oh, today I was in a Starbucks at 18th and Pearl. They, they do brewed decaf there. It's about the only place on, if I, around town I could find brewed decaf. So I, I, I drink black. So I went in and I ordered it. And Wendy's in there. She's the manager. There's two others working. And, uh, and I, I was in there in my suit. And uh, I said, hey, I got an idea. And they're like, what? I said, how about if you guys take off an hour, close, close the Starbucks for an hour, come around the corner to church with us, and we'll have a message on the resurrected life. And afterwards, you can come to the wedding in your backyard, in our backyard. And she goes, oh, I don't think corporate would be happy with us if we did that. <laughs> and so they gave me the coffee. Then like, each one of them told me, thank you for inviting us. <laughs> we all know. We all know we should be living this life for God. We, we've seen the... Mm, We've seen what happens in our lives when we make our own decisions apart from God. We've seen what happens, right? Where it goes. We know what we feel on the inside. 
You see what it does in relationships? There should be enough for us to say, you know, it's time for me to go ahead and quit doing my own show here and do it God's way. And surrender to the resurrected life he wants me to live. To do relationships that God wants me to do. You know, just put an hour in on Sunday. It doesn't do it because I grew up that way. That has more to satisfy my conscience than anything else, I think. But you and I have the opportunity to do this God's way. If we want to. We don't have to because God gives us free will. And because of love, God's not going to make you because that would that be a shotgun wedding and, and that's not really love. That's coercion, force. So God says, I'm going to give you the option and you can live your life and, and even your dying breath and not follow me if that's your choice. But God says, because of love, I'm going to do things throughout your life to try to draw you to me. I'm going to send you people. I'm going to put thoughts in your brain. I'm going to have situations happen around you to make you think. I'm just going to have a lot of things happen in your life to get you to wake up. It's kind of like when we have a child who's, who's going a way we know they shouldn't be going. We know when they get a certain age, we know we can't stop them any longer. Right. Yeah. With the little kids, it's great because you just you, you dominate the whole scene. There's not that. You just dominate everything. When they get older and that doesn't happen. As, you know, that, that goes away. Yeah. And they can just say, whatever, not the door. True, true confessions from Rachel here. <laughs> Maybe he's talking about Trey's son. I'm not sure which. <laughs> so because of love, God gives us a choice. You and I get, he's not going to make, he's not going to hog tie us and drag us to heaven and say, ah, I got you here, what are you going to do now? <laughs> so he gives us that option. And hopefully before our, our dying breath, we will surrender to his life, yes. die to our old life, and, and live a resurrected life. Hopefully that'll be something you and I do. I have a few other things I wanted to say here, but um, I'm going to go ahead and ask my wife to come on up. Come on, Cheryl. 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 Oh, happy Easter, everybody. Um, you know, I, I have to say, I love this time of year. Uh, I love the newness, the spring of uh, time. And uh, around our house, you know, we bought this house last April, and so this is really kind of the first real beginning of spring that we're getting to see. And my husband is very excited about this, and he's been doing a lot of planting of, of things. And so he's been burying these little crocus bulbs, even in like uh, the knots of trees and putting a little dirt in there and that kind of thing, right? So really, really cute, and we're all looking forward to it. Realized, oh my gosh, look at how fat the squirrels are getting around here! <laughs> they have been digging up those crocus so, so that's just a little imagery for for the rest of my talk, okay? Um, <laughs> Because they, uh, they are a challenge, and it takes a lot of work to bring about this, this life. And um, so I'm going to ask us to turn over to 1 Corinthians 10 All right, Cheryl. and read this one verse, um, <clears throat> verse uh, 13. Come on, Cheryl. And it says there that um, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So, you know, Kelly's talking about how God created this resurrected life for us. But we have to live it. We have to choose to live it. And um, I think this verse helps me to understand a lot of what it takes. And um, here's what I mean, that to live a resurrected life, we actually have to take that way of escape over and over and over yeah. and over and over and yeah. over again, even when we end up failing. Even when the squirrels come along and steal the crocus bulb, <laughs> you know, um, steals that joy, steals that hope, steals that victory. We got to get back up again and say, "No, I am replanting that bulb, 
and I am going to do this again. I love how he says here that, first of all, no temptation has seized any of us except what's common. I think God really, really wants us to hear that. I think Satan really wants to plug your ears on that one. Because he wants you to think that you're unique, that no one can understand you, no one can help you, no one will even care or even dare to love you because you're whatever, okay? (laughs) And uh, I've heard those thoughts. I'm sure you all have too. Um, All of us are tempted in many, 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 many ways. Um, And actually, there's no worse temptation than any other temptation because sin is sin in God's eyes. You know, whatever we're talking about. Um, I think Satan... He operates through fear, shame, and embarrassment and prevents us from experiencing the the opportunities that God gives us to really see that, you know what, God can make me live a resurrected life. Um, And I wanted to say this too at the very beginning, just to say temptation is not equal to sin. Right. I think a lot of that Satan blurs in our minds. And what I mean by that is, I'm just going to quote these scriptures basically. In Hebrews 4.15, it says that Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So think about that for a second. And then on top of that, it says in Hebrews 2.18, Jesus suffered during his temptations, and because of that, he's able to help us in our temptation. Now, when I think about suffering, Jesus suffering, that means he was tempted. Like, he craved whatever it was, or he felt it, he smelt it, he was there, he could touch it, but he didn't. He chose not to, and I think that That's really important that a lot of times we're feeling all slimy because we just got tempted. And we actually said no, and we're still feeling bad about it, okay? But I think on top of that, we do sin in different, many different ways. Um, uh, And I think that, so what I wanna say mainly today to you is that the way of escape, a lot of times is just beginning to be open about it what you're actually going through because we first of all need God first John chapter 1 talks about how if if we say that we haven't sinned the truth isn't in us you know we don't we don't understand yet um God knows our hearts he knows everything he knows every single thought every desire every 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 so he knows your sin he knows my sin and so God knows the dialogue has to start with him wow god now i see it that's really how it starts and then from there god says that we get to you know work things out with him that he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us it says god wants to do that in our lives and then he says hey, and I want you to talk to each other about it and pray for each other. He says that in James 5, 16. And so he says there that when we are open with each other and, and confess our sins to each other that and pray for each other, that we get healed. So it's really like he's giving us the way of escape. That's the point he's showing us. So... You know, I don't know about you, but I have certain sins and temptations that are just still present to this day. Yeah. You know, when I became a Christian like 30 years ago or whatever, um, honestly, immorality and um, deceitfulness and um, pride in the form of insecurity, those were dominant sins. You know, fear of man, wanting people to love me, cowardice, you know, a lot of that. Now... I see much more, it's selfish ambition and uh, jealousy. Those are things that, that will be hard for me. And so I, I thought, you know, this is so funny. I just go through this thing with sisters, and then Kelly asked me, would you like to share tomorrow? <laughs> and so I'm going to tell you, like, just, just 
two days ago. Here's what happened to Cheryl Boyd. Okay, um, so hang with me. Um, so we have this really incredible, um, you know, women's event. I mean, it's just so fun. It felt like a girls' night out. It was great. And so, um, so. I, I see that there's this visitor there that I had met a couple of months before um, through a sister. And um, so, you know, I, I, I said, oh my gosh, I recognize you, blah, blah, blah. And so uh, she didn't recognize me. Hey, that was like de depressing. Okay. <laughs> well, she kind of did. But we were in masks and stuff anyway. So, um, But the other thing was, that another sister had brought her because the original sister who had introduced us had told that sister, hey, can, can you reach out to this person? So, you know, okay, I don't know about you, but this is my selfish ambition. I think in my, my brain, oh, geez. So that sister couldn't trust me, you know, to like invite this person or be a friend to them. And my initial reaction was jealousy and, you know, frustration and embarrassment and shame. Then I mentioned who's that from, right? Um, and so, but I admitted it, finally. Like, I think I'm struggling right now. <laughs> I think there's something bothering me. And I sensed it at the event, but like, you, it's hard to take care of things with 35 other people in the room. So anyway, um, I knew that I'm gonna need to, to deal with this. So the next day, um, you know, I resolved, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call. But the process of that re resolution of I'm gonna call and talk to the sisters involved, it, it, it looked a lot like I want them to understand this was a temptation and a place where I think I even failed a bit, okay? I think I sinned. And I wanted them also to know it's not their problem. They didn't do anything wrong. And also, I wanted them to know that I want to learn from this. And if there's a reason, Sister A, that you couldn't trust me with this situation, I want to learn from that. Tell me what you see in me. So instead of Satan having the victory, Come on. you know, I get to learn something from the whole thing too, which Satan is always trying to rob you of, the real stuff. Right. He'll give you the fake stuff. So anyway, but we have to listen to how God says, acknowledge it and confess it. And I tell you what, did we laugh, those sisters, <laughs> when I talked to them? Did, was there joy? Was there a rawness? Was there like, we love each other. We are there for each other. Because they didn't look at me like, oh, you're really weird, and like, you're supposed to be the leader? You know, wow, I don't want to go to your church. You know, it wasn't like that. It's like, okay, yeah, I totally get that. I, I might have felt that too, if that happened to me. And, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean we're gonna stay in it. We get to change. So, um, so I think for, for all of us, you know, there's some things and you know, maybe for you, it's a sexual temptation that's hard to talk about, like uh, you know, like a lustful fantasy that you keep having, or you know, a same-sex attraction thing going on, or you're struggling with masturbation. You know, it's just like uh, uh, pornography. Just anything like that can be really hard. And I just want people to understand there's no temptation except what is common to man. Please hear that. You are not alone at all, and you can overcome this. It will not be in a moment. Just like, you know, trying to forgive a real problem in, you know, in your heart towards somebody else, you decide you're going to forgive them, but you know it's a process, right? We all know that. So the same thing on all this other stuff. Um, maybe it's some kind of addiction, you know, uh, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, or, or it's even food. You know, food's one of the hardest things because you have to deal with food. Some of us deny ourselves way too much because we're controlled by it. Some of us are overdoing it. I'm more in that category. Um, you know, but it, it's a real problem. Maybe it's our pride. Like I said, insecurity, arrogance, um, just needing to, you know, look right, fighting with people, 
uh, that's how it can be expressed. We're really just so, so really stuck in pride. I'm a mess. I am a wreck. And I praise you that you have allowed me to understand that, and now you want to help me. And other people want to help me. And life is so much better. Let me tell you, before the phone calls versus after the phone calls, really different experience of life, okay? Um, so I think um, last, last thing, oh no, sorry, can I say two more things? A secret, a secret I want to share with you is that honestly, if you're not talking about anything ever, I'm going to worry about you. Yeah. Because it tells me, gosh, I don't think they're free yet. I don't think they really understand how much they're loved yet and how much of a battle they're actually in. Um, <coughs> we need a resurrected community. It, you know, God calls it his family, the household of God. And we don't always know how to help each other. I'll say this, one other scripture, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. He says, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak. Be patient with everyone. I, I think we, we need to understand this is messy business. We need wisdom to know, gosh, <clears throat> is this person weak? Is this person timid? Is this person idle? You know, we need, we need to pray yeah. yes. so we know how to help each other. Because the yeah. point is not to tolerate each other's sin. That is not what God is trying to do. What God is trying to do is create a family that walks alongside each other and helps each other out of the sin to live this resurrected life every day. So um, I want to encourage you that we can fight the squirrels and win. Amen. Those squirrels. And that's from a woman who uh, didn't want to speak. Uh, wow. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. That person yeah. like when she does want to speak. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I've got to say, it's, it's pretty amazing that uh, in the past nine months together, we have gotten to deal with uh, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and now a drug called tamoxifen. And, uh, that is Amen. Amen. Um, to close out, just given the choice, and there's, there's, there's two options in life. We like to muddy the waters in our society and talk about all the different options of how to live life and where it all leads and philosophies. But there's only two lives. We live a, a resurrected life or we don't. Mm. It's up to us to choose. And if you would, I will close out over in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. It says the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. And, and we know, don't we, when we're doing what something we should be doing, we, we know. It says, uh, it lists these different things, sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, and hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, and sin in your anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as therefore those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's the life of a non-resurrected. Now, look in verse uh, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. You can have as much of these as you want. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. As the 18-year-old college student, I got to decide between the two, which way do I want to go? I lived in the dorms, 300 miles from home, money in my pocket. Red-blooded American male with all the feelings and temptations and desires thereof. But I had to choose which way do I want to go. I have two choices in life. I can be moaned at and be angry and feel like 
God, I didn't even ask to be born, much less for this guy to die for me 2,000 years ago. I didn't get to ask my parents to have me or not, but they had me anyway. A lot of things in life I didn't ask me, but here I am. And I get to choose which way I'm going to go. You get to choose which way you're going to go. Verses 19 through 21 is one option. The other option, verses 22 and 23. As an 18-year-old college student who didn't know much about life, it made sense to me that I want the latter instead of the former. I've had a little taste of the former. And although that may be exciting at the moment, some of those, it always led to bad places. That made sense to me. Those other ones look like they're going to lead to good places. And I don't have to have the problems I've seen in my family and other places in life, in marriage, in relationships, happiness and lack thereof. I want to pursue God in His way. I want to do it His way. I want to live the resurrected life. You get to choose. You get to choose. I do it my way, or I do it God's way. Let's pray. God, thank you for this chance today to come open your word. We want to live a resurrected life. I want to live a resurrected life. Help us to have in our hearts a desire to want to please you and love you back, just like you love us. Be motivated and inspired by that love. And choose between the two options we have in life. It's a resurrected life or not. We get to choose. Out of your love, you've allowed it to be a choice. You're not going to make us. You'll try to persuade us. But in the end, you let it be our decision because that's the only way to make it really love. We'll lay down our lives for one another. Thank you so much, God, for this option to hear and understand from your word that you've made it abundantly clear. I pray we choose life and the resurrected life. In Jesus' name.